Last time I was here was actually in the crowd at a music show here, so it's pretty wild for me to be up here on stage talking to you all. I'm super excited. Anyway, my name is Ben Liebwald. I lead engineering at Harvey, and today I'd like to talk to you about how we build and evaluate legal AI. So this is the outline of the talk, five parts to it. I'll talk a little bit about Harvey for those of you who are not familiar with the product or the company. Then I'll talk about quality and legal and why it's difficult, how we build and evaluate products, and some learning and hot takes. I was told they had to be hot takes. All right, let's dive in. So Harvey is really domain-specific AI for legal and professional services. We offer a suite of products, from a general purpose assistant for drafting and summarizing docs, to tools for large-scale document extraction, to many domain-specific agents and workflows. And the vision we have for the product is twofold. We want you to do all of your work in Harvey, and we want Harvey to be available wherever you do your work. You here being lawyers and legal professionals and professional service providers. So as an example, you can use Harvey to summarize documents or draft new ones. Our AI can leverage firm-specific information, such as firm internal, uh, firm internal knowledge bases or their templates, to customize the output. We also offer tools for large-scale document analysis, which is a really important use case in uh, legal. Think about a lot of due diligence or legal discovery tasks where you're typically dealing with thousands of contracts or documents, thousands of emails that need to be analyzed, which typically is done manually and is really, really tedious. So Harvey can analyze hundreds or thousands of documents at once and output the, to a table or summarize the results. This literally saves hours, sometimes weeks of work. And of course, we offer many workflows that enable users to accomplish complex tasks such as redline an analysis, drafting certain types of documents, and more. And customers can tailor these workflows to their own needs. We're at an agent conference, so naturally we want to talk a little bit about agentic capabilities we've added to the product as well, such as multi-step agentic search, more personalization and memory, and the ability to execute long-running tasks. And we have a lot more cooking there that um, we'll be launching soon. We're trusted by law firms and large enterprises around the world. We have just under 400 customers on, I think, all continents, maybe except Antarctica at this point. And in the US, one-third of the largest 100, and I think eight out of 10 of the largest 10 law firms use Harvey. All right, let's talk about quality and why it's difficult to build and evaluate high-quality products in this domain. So this may not come as a surprise to you, but lawyers deal with lots and lots and lots of documents, many of them very complex, often hundreds, sometimes thousands of pages in length. And typically, those documents don't exist in a vacuum. They're part of large corpora of case law, legislation, or other case-related documents. Often, those documents contain extensive references to other parts of the document or other documents in the same corpus. And the documents themselves can be pretty complex. It's not at all unheard of to have documents with lots of handwriting, scanned nodes, multi-column, multiple mini-pages on the same page, embedded tables, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of complexity in the document understanding piece. The outputs we need to generate are pretty complex, too. Long text, obviously, complex tables, and sometimes even diagrams or charts for things like reports not to mention the complex language that legal professionals are uh, used to. And mistakes can literally be career impacting, so verification is key. And this isn't really just about hallucinations, completely made up statements, but really more about slightly misconstrued or misinterpreted statements that are just not quite factually correct. So Harvey has a citation feature to ground all statements in verifiable sources and to allow our users to verify that you know, the summary provided by the AI is indeed correct and, and acceptable. And importantly, quality is a really nuanced and subjective concept in this domain. I don't know if you can read this. I wouldn't expect you to read all of it. But basically, this is two answers to the same question, a document understanding question in this case, asking about a specific clause in a specific contract. I think it's called materiality scrape and indemnification. Don't ask me what exactly that means. Um, but the point I'm trying to get across is they look similar. They're actually both factually correct. Neither of them have any hallucinations. Take my word for it. But answer two was actually strongly preferred by our in-house lawyers when they looked at both of these answers. 
And the reason is that there's additional nuance in the write-up and more details in some of the definitions that they really appreciated. So the point is, it's really difficult to assess automatically um, which of these is, is better or what's, what quality even means. And then last but not least, obviously our customers' work is very sensitive in nature. Obtaining reliable data sets, product feedback, or even bug reports can be pretty challenging for us. And so all of that combined makes it really challenging to build uh, high quality products in legal AI. So how do we do it? Before evaluation, I wanted to actually briefly touch on how we build products. We believe, and I think Harrison actually just talked about this, that the best evals are tightly integrated into the product development process. And the best teams approach uh, eval holistically with the rest of product development. So here are some product development principles that are important to us. First off, we're an applied AI company. So what this really means is that we need to combine state-of-the-art AI with best-in-class UI. It's really not just about having the best AI, but really about having the best AI that's packaged up in such a way that it meets our customers where they are, it helps them solve their real-world problems. The second principle, and this is something that we've talked a lot about and that's very, very uh, key to the way that we operate, is lawyer in the loop. So we really include lawyers at every stage of the product development process. As I mentioned before, there's an incredible amount of complexity and nuance in legal, and so their domain expertise and their user empathy are really critical um, in helping us create products, building us, helping us build great products. So lawyers work side by side with engineers, designers, product managers, and so on, on all aspects of building the product, from identifying use cases, to data set collection, to eval rubric uh, creation, to UI iteration and end-to-end -end testing. They've, they're truly embedded. Lawyers also play a really important part of our go-to-market strategy. They're involved in demoing to customers, collecting customer feedback, and translating that back to our product development teams as well. And then third, prototype over PRD. PRD is a product requirement doc or any kind of spec doc, really. We really believe that the actual work of building great products in this domain and probably many other domains happens through frequent prototyping and iteration. Spec docs can be helpful, but prototypes really make the work tangible and easier to grok. And the quicker we can build these, the quicker we can iterate and learn. So we've invested a ton in building out our own AI prototyping stack to iterate on prompts, all aspects of the algorithm, as well as the UI. So I wanted to share an example to make this come to life a little bit. Let's say we wanted to build out a specific workflow to help users, uh, to help um, our customers draft a specific type of document, let's say a client alert. Now in this case, lawyers would provide the initial context. What is this document? What is it even used for? When does this typically come up in a typical lawyer's day-to-day -day work? Um, and what else is important to know about it? Then lawyers would collaborate with engineers and product to build out the algorithm and the eval data set. Our engineers build a prototype. And then we typically go through many iterations of this where we look at initial outputs, look at results, do we like it, and, and continue to iterate until it looks good to us as a, as a team of experts. In parallel, we build out a final product that's more embedded in our actual product um, where we can iterate on the UI as well. This has really worked well for us. We've built dozens of workflows this way, and um, it's, it's one of the things that, that really stands out for us in terms of how we build product. OK, let's talk about evaluation. So we think about eval in three ways, and Harrison actually alluded to some of these as well. But for us, the most important way by far still is how can we effect, efficiently collect human preference judgments? Already talked about how nuance and uh, complexity is really important in this domain or very uh, prevalent in this domain. And so human preference judgments and human evals remain our highest uh, quality signal. And so a lot of what we spend our time on and how we think about this here is how can we improve the throughput? How can we improve and streamline our operations to collect this data um, so that we can run more of them more quickly at lower cost, et cetera? Second, how can we build model-based auto evaluations, or LLM as a judge, that approximate the quality of human review? And then for a lot of our complex multi-step uh, workflows and agents, how can we break the problem down into steps so that we can evaluate each step and have it be something that is in the loop? Okay, 
let's talk a little bit about human preference ratings or human, human eval. So one classic uh, tool that we use here is, is the classic side-by-side. -side. This is basically, uh, we curate a standardized query data set of common questions that uh, our customers might ask or common things that come up in a workflow. And then we ask human raters to evaluate two responses to the same query. So in this instance, the query is write an outline of all hearsay exemptions based on the federal rules of evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And then the model or two different versions of a model generate two, two separate responses and we put this in front of raters and ask them to evaluate it. We'll typically ask them, okay, which of these do you prefer, just relatively speaking, and then on a scale of say one to seven, from one being very bad to seven being very good, how would you rate each response? As well as some qualitative um, feedback that they may, may have in addition. And then we use this to make launch decisions, whether to ship a new model, a new prompt or algorithm. We've invested quite a bit of time in our own tool chain for this, and that's really allowed us to scale these kinds of evals over the, over the course of the last years, and we use them routinely for many different tasks. Okay, but of course, human eval is very time consuming and expensive, uh, especially since we're leveraging domain experts, like trained attorneys, to uh, answer most of these questions. And so we wanna leverage automated and model-driven evals wherever possible. However, there are really a number of uh, challenges when it comes to real-world complexity there. I think Harrison actually just talked about this as well. So here's an example of one of the academic benchmarks out there in the field uh, for legal, um, legal questions. It's called Legal Bench. And you'll see that the question here is fairly simple in that it's a simple yes-no answer or a simple yes-no question at the end saying, is there hearsay? Um, and there's no reference to any other material outside of the question itself. And that's really quite simplistic, and most of the real-world work just doesn't look like that at all. So we actually built our own eval benchmark called Big Law Bench, which contains complex open-ended tasks with subjective answers that mimic much more closely how lawyers do work in the real world. So in this instance, it will say, that as an example question, analyze these trial documents, draft an analysis of conflicts, gaps, contradictions, et cetera, et cetera. And the output here is probably paragraphs of text. So how do we get an LLM to evaluate these automatically? Well, we have to come up with a rubric and break it down into a few different categories. So this is an example rubric for what um, a, this single question in, in um, Big Law Bench might look like. Um, we might look at structure. So for example, is the response formatted as a table with columns X, Y, and Z? We might evaluate style. Does the response emphasize actionable advice? We'll ask about substance. Does the response state certain facts? Like in this particular question, the question uh, pertain to a document, you know, does the response actually mention certain facts mentioned in the document? And finally, does the response contain hallucinations or misconstrued information? And importantly, like all of the exact evaluation criteria here were crafted by our in-house domain experts, the lawyers that I just mentioned, and they're, they're really distinct for each QA pair. So there's a lot of work that goes into crafting these evals and the rubrics for them. Okay, last eval principle, breaking the problem down. So workflows and agents are really multi-step processes, and breaking the problem down into components enables us to evaluate each of these steps separately, which really helps make the problem more tractable. So one canonical, exa canonical example for this is RAG, let's say for a QA over a large corpus. Typical steps for RAG may include, first you rewrite the query, then you find the matching chunks and docs using a search or retrieval system, then you generate the answer from the sources, and last, you wanna maybe create citations to ground the, sources, or the, the answer in facts. Each of these can be evaluated as its own step, and the same idea applies to complex workflows, citations, et cetera, et cetera. And so the more we can do this, the more we can leverage automated evals. So to put this all together, I wanted to give an example of a recent launch. Um, in April, OpenAI actually released GPT 4.1. We were fortunate to get an early look at the model before it came out to GA. And so we first ran Big Law Bench to get a rough idea of its quality. You can see on the chart here, it's on the far left, uh, GPT 4.1 in the context of Harvey's uh, AI systems. 
performed better than other foundation models. So we felt that the results are pretty promising here, and so we moved on to uh, human rate evaluations to further assess the quality. In this chart, you can see the performance of our baseline system and on the new system using 4.1 um, on the set of human radar evals that I was just talking about earlier. So again, we're asking raters to evaluate the answer on a given question on a scale from one to seven, one being very bad, seven being very good. And you can see that in the new system, it skews much more to the right, so clearly the results here look much more promising and, and much higher quality. So this looked great. We could have just launched it at this point, but in addition to that, we ran a lot of additional tests on more product-specific data sets uh, to really help us understand where it worked well and where it had shortcomings, um, and also ran a bunch of uh, additional internal dog fooding to collect qualitative feedback uh, from our in-house teams. This actually helped us catch a few regressions. So for example, 4.1 was much more likely to start every response with the word, certainly, exclamation mark which is not really what we were going for and it's kind of off brand for us. So we first had to address those issues before we can roll it out to customers. Okay, so what are some things we learned? Well, first learning really is sharpen your ax. At the end of the day, a lot of evaluation is in my mind really an engineering problem. So the more time we invest in building out strong tooling, great processes and documentation, the more uh, it will pay back quickly. In our case, I could say it paid back tenfold. It became much easier to run evals, which meant that more teams started using them and used them more often. And as such, the iteration speed and our product quality really improved, as well as our own confidence in our product quality, which meant that we were confident in shipping it to customers more quickly. I didn't mention this earlier, but we leveraged Langsmith extensively for some subset of our evals, um, especially a lot of the routine evals that uh, pertain to when we break tasks down. Um, but we've also built some of our own tools for some of the more human rater uh, focused evaluations. So I would say don't be afraid to mix and match and evaluate and find what works best for you. Learning number two, this is kind of the, the flip side of this, which is that evals matter, but taste really does too. Obviously, having rigorous and repeatable evaluations is critical. We wouldn't be able to make product progress without them. But human judgment, qualitative feedback, and taste really matter too. We learn a ton from the qualitative feedback we get from our raters, from our internal dog fooding, and from our customers. And we constantly make improvements to the product that don't really impact eval metrics in any meaningful way, but they clearly make the product better. For example, by making it faster, more consistent, or easier to use. And my last uh, uh, learning, and maybe this is a little bit more forward-looking and a, a bit of a hot take, but as we're here talking about agents, I wanted to talk a little bit about data. And the take here is the most important data doesn't exist yet. So maybe one reductive or simplistic take on AI progress in the last decade has been that we've made a ton of progress by just taking more and more publicly available data and creating larger and larger models. And that's, of course, been very, very successful. It's led to the amazingly capable foundation models that we all know and love and use every day, and they continue to improve. But I would argue that to build the main specific agentic workflows for real-world tasks, we actually need more process data, the kind of data that shows you how to get things done inside of the, those firms today. So think about an M&A transaction, a merger between two firms. This is typically many months, sometimes years of work, and it's typically broken down into hundreds of subtasks or projects. And there's usually no written playbook for all of this. This is not all summarized neatly in a single spreadsheet. It's often captured in hallway conversations or maybe handwritten margins in a document that says, this is how we do this here. And so if we can extract that kind of data, that kind of process data, um, then I think it has the, and apply that to models, it has the potential to really need, uh, lead to the next uh, breakthroughs when it comes to building agentic systems. And this is something I'm really excited about and that I'm looking forward to spending more time on over the, uh, over the next few years. And with that, thank you. It was a real pleasure speaking here today. And enjoy the rest of the conference.